Welcome to the Rorima expedition session. Uh, this time last year, the four of us and uh, two other people, Wilson and Dan, um, were on Mount Rorima in Guyana. Um, expedition team led by Leo Holding. And we're going to start the show by um, showing you the film that we launched just before we left um, 13 months ago for that expedition. We're going to climb the prow of Mount Roraima in Guyana. It is a 2,000 foot high overhanging ship's prow. The plan is to airdrop all the kit into the jungle at the base of the wall. We will hack through the jungle for about a week to where we drop that stuff. With a bit of luck, we'll find it all. And then the real challenge, which is this really super proud overhanging quartzite sandstone cliff. We are going as a team of six. There is Waldo Etherington, extreme recreational tree climber. Anna Taylor, 21 years old. This is going to be her first expedition and her first big wall. Wilson Cuthbert, he's a really good climber. And then there's Matt Pycroft and Dan Howard who are coming to shoot the action. We are intending to send out video, voice and photo content almost daily. Um, so come along for the ride. It's going to be a hell of an adventure. Who knows what's going to happen? And why don't you join us? And it's fun looking back at all this because obviously I've been editing this film for the past few months, but um, we're going to show these guys some footage that they've not seen. Um, but Leo, can you just start by talking us through um, where we were, what we did and the inspiration for the trip? So this is the, the great northern prow of Mount Roraima. It's not a particularly famous mountain, which is surprising because look at it. <clears throat> you can, they're called tapuis, these things. They stick up out the jungle like something out of a... Of a a science fiction novel. Um, you know, Table Mountain in, uh, in South Africa is, is like a tapiri, but that thing is three times the size. And uh, here you can see where it is. It's right on the border between Brazil, Venezuela, but that northern prow part lies wholly within Guyana. Now, Guyana is the only English-speaking country in South America. But what's really unique about this mountain, it is famous in Guyana, but it's almost, well, as the crow flies, it's about 50 kilometers from the closest um, community, which is a little village called Philippi. And the interior of Guyana, you know, you're deep in the Amazon rainforest here, you're right on the northern edge of the Amazon basin. Um, there's no roads. So the only way you can get around is either on the rivers, of which there are many, and, uh, and little bush plains. But even the closest landing strip is, is 50 k's in a straight line through untracked jungle, which is, you know, at least a week. Now, I've been wanting to go here for my entire life. Some of you will be familiar with the, uh, the story of Arthur Conan Doyle's famous story, The Lost Worlds. But a sporting risk, young fella. That's the salt of existence. Then it's worth living again. We're all getting a deal too soft and dull and comfy. Give me the great wastelands and the wide spaces with a gun in my fist and something to look for that's worth finding. So that's Lord John Roxton, one of the heroes of, uh, of that famous story. And that classic tale, by the way, if anybody hasn't read it, it's a really short book. I recommend you get it and read it or listen to the audio. But we listened to it when we were away, right? It's, yeah. it's really good, like Epic. classic mm -hmm. late Victorian uh, kids story. It's, not, it's a bit gruesome by kids stories of today, not particularly <laughs> PC either, but, um, but it's, it's a corker. Anyway, it's a real place. The Mount Roraima is where that story is set. It's an actual real place, and you can see how it inspires, like, you know, fantasy. Um, more recently, oh yeah, so this is the prow, and it's massive. You don't really get a sense of scale in these aerial shots. To give you a, a bit of a sense, it's, that's about 2,000 feet high, that prow. That's twice the size of the Shard in London, and it's solidly overhanging, like 15 degrees or more the whole way. It's, it's a real prominent feature. Um, yeah, more recently, some of you will be familiar with the, the Disney Pixar cartoon, Up. Well, once again, that is, it's a real place. It's, it is Roraima. The, the director and the animators actually went out there and helicoptered onto the top and spent a few days up there making sketches. Uh, so yeah, great cartoon as well. Okay, so for me, the reason I wanted to go here is, in 1973, a British team uh, led by um, who was it? It was Hamish, wasn't it? Yeah, Hamish, Hamish McInnes. McInnes. Uh, with Joe Brown, Don Willans, and Mo. Uh, Mo Antoine, like a full all-star team from the 70s. They went out there, uh, sponsored by the BBC and the Observer, and they made the first ascent of that prow. 
and they made a film which I first saw when I was about 10, which was right about when I got into climbing as well. And it's, it's dynamite, it's a real classic. It's called Climbing to the Lost Worlds. And I'm just gonna show you the last like 30 seconds of the film because uh, it's, it's perversely inspiring. <laughs> Well, I'd say, ten, all in all, it was a, a really bloody tough climb. After going on that face, I think I'd have sort of descaled a boiler in Sheffield, in a way. All the creepy crawlies, the vegetation, the weather. I mean, the weather's really atrocious. And all these things make it into a very serious route indeed. You know, I'd say that it was the ultimate in masochism, that plan. So, given how awful that looks for everybody else, why did that inspire you? <laughs> oh, man, it's just such a full-scale suffer fest. If you watch that movie, they had an awful time. They had loads of logistical problems, knee-deep mud, snakes, spiders, scorpions, like, coming out the cliff whilst you're climbing up, all, all like, proper you know, a swashbuckling old school adventure. And, and I'd always wanted to go and check it out. And something about that long approach as well, you know, it's, there's very few places in the world where you've got an approach which takes over a week. Mm. And to clarify, that's just to get to the bottom of the, of the ridge. That's not to the start of the actual rock climbing, which we'll come to. So, you know, it's pretty much two weeks to get there, um, which is logistically a massive ball ache. Um, so yeah, here you can see is prepping this is actually just down the road we're in Kendall right now this is my little climbing wall in Stave Lake and Anna and Waldo and Dan and Matt came and helped me faff for about well we did a three-day epic faff didn't we yeah. Yeah. Go, that was kind of out there <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's like how much did we have in the end it was about half a ton wasn't it, it was yeah like bang ton, on yeah. the nose wasn't yeah because it? yeah. you got to remember there's all the food not just for the six of us but for at one point there was like 12 local porters with us and we were catering for everyone. So there's hundreds of kilos of things. So there's the crew. And all the kit. Look how clean we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, didn't look like we looked pretty good back then. <laughs> so yeah, we've got literally, and we had more than half a ton, I think it was 700 kilos total, to move that amount of stuff over that kind of range. Bear in mind the porters need to get out again. You, so they can't carry very much. They can only, because they have to bring 14 days worth of food for themselves. So they can only carry like 10 kilos each, which is going to take at least two weeks. Um, and you'd need, what, 50, 60 porters? Plus, yeah. Which would be a massive headache moving through the jungle with that. So we came up with another plan. Yeah, which we're now going to go to the first of the raw clips we've cut together to show you what the trip was like. And um, this is the airdrop. As we can see, you know, close-knit team, it all went well. Um, Just to say on that picture, right, that parachute, we are throwing all our stuff into a remote part of the Amazon rainforest, <laughs> hundreds of kilometres from anywhere except this one little Amerindian community, into dense forest with a jerry-rig system of parachutes that a mate of mine made. Um, it was a really clever system, so obviously the stuff's going to get stuck in trees, right? Each one of those weighs 125 kilos, but the load hangs about 200 feet below the parachute. The idea being that the load is going to penetrate through the canopy and go to the ground, and then the, the parachute will get stuck in the trees. And then to find them, we had these awesome little tracking devices that my mate James Dickinson, who 
lives just around the corner made with these awesome little radio transmitters, a bit like an avalanche transceiver, and these really loud beepers, 100 decibel beepers, and these bit bright flashing lights. But if we hadn't found those bags, <laughs> that's all the climbing gear and all the food. Game over. And even, even if we'd have lost any one of them, we'd have struggled to keep going. Mm. So yeah, there was quite a lot riding on it. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it's been like 10 years since I sat and watched the Asgard project. And I think looking back at that, having not known you then, you don't realize how much effort goes into making this happen. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, getting these parachutes together and the margin for error and... Well, it sounds so simple, right? We just, I mean, this is the same plane that takes you to Philippi. It sounds that, oh yeah, we'll just throw our stuff out with parachutes and we won't have to carry it. Well, it's not. <laughs> There's like so much that can go wrong. Remember the test run we did? We fell out the back of the aircraft. Oh, yeah, Because yeah. <laughs> 125 kilos is heavy, right? So we did a dry run in the aircraft on the ground and I fell out the back of the plane. <laughs> I mean, we were clipped in, right? But um, We did get that on camera as well. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so then we landed in Philippi. Yeah. And it'd be good to talk a little bit about the expedition team in the end, because the six of us that started, you know, we topped out with eight. What was the inspiration behind, you know, adding to the team? Well, Waldo and I actually met in Guyana, weirdly. Yeah. Um, on a Discovery Show TV job back in 2014, was it? Yeah. And, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, Guyana, it, they speak English. So they have their own language as well. They speak Akawaii, but these guys live out in the rainforest in these communities, pretty much subsistence farming, hunting, living off the forest, but they speak Caribbean English. Yeah. So you can easily communicate with them out in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, and they're badasses, aren't they? You yeah. know, you've worked with them a bunch now. Yeah, they're super switched on, really kind of just fit, fit, healthy knowledgeable people. Um, yeah. I mean, can we talk a bit about that? You know, what, what is it about these people that makes them special and, and about jungle travel with these local people? Yeah, well, I think being in the forest with them was incredible just to see the kind of low impact way that they, they travel. These rucksacks are a prime example. They're called warashis. And these are like the, the heavy duty ones. So they'll make these out of um, vines and lianas and rattan. Um, and they carry them with a head strap. Um, and we'll give them backpacks with all the comfy carry straps and adjust it all for them. And they'll put them upside down into a rashi and strap that to their back. Uh, but they work really well. And then they've, they've got the like super low impact ones, which they, they're kind of one way trip. So they'll just make them for the journey. And then they get there and they leave it in the forest and it just disintegrates. And they put all the heavy stuff at the top. Yeah, don't they? It's it like they so pack it the balanced. opposite way to us. But they're so nimble, bare feet across these little logs across all the rivers. A bit different to our system. Yeah, totally different. So. Can you talk us through a bit of your background? You know, you've spent some time in the jungle, it's fair to say. Yeah, I spent a lot of time in, in forests and jungles over the years. Um, and actually a, a lot of trips to Guyana, to this, to this kind of region. Um, and it's an incredible, beautiful place. There's, there's so much endemism there. Um, just the life that you find that, the, the epiphytes. Um, I won't bang on them about them too much because I never did that during the expedition. Um, but just an incredible array of, of wildlife and plants. Um, really beautiful really untouched and all these rivers that transect the rainforest um they're just incredible they, you can you travel up and down the rivers and it's, it's a huge source of like fish so most of their diet is is fish essentially and that's how they sort of live and get a lot of their food especially when you're on the move through the forest and can you talk a little bit about you know the way we travel how do we cross rivers and you know it, it, are these places regularly trod other than not, local people not at all it was it was like a jungle gym quite literally there's so many log crossings across the rivers and little vines and sometimes you have to wade through it and it was just uh, like an incredible trail that we opened up. Um, just absolutely stunning and, and really, really untrodden, like barely anyone's been there before. Yeah. Um, and it was incredible to spend that amount of time with these locals traveling through such a beautiful place and seeing how they live and travel. So that was great, wasn't it? That's one of the best things we've had at the festival. Uh, Leo Holding and Matt Pycroft talking about their amazing adventure. If you enjoyed that, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, and if you want to watch the entire one hour interview, which has got far more detail, then go to the Kendall Mountain Player. Details below.